MOOCs, which are a somewhat unfortunate acronym for Massive Open Online Classes, I think provide a tremendous opportunity for medical care both within our academic institutions, say in the United States and outside. Uh, within academic institutions, I think they provide a resource for blended learning in which students can take the content that they need in order to uh, perform effectively in those courses in what is actually a more engaging and interactive format than just sitting in a lecture being talked at for an hour. And that leads leaves that precious classroom time where the student um, is there in the room with a practicing physician who has real um, skills and expertise for a much more engaging dialogue where the students talk to each other and also talk to the instructor and benefit from that. I think MOOCs provide us with the opportunity to create better doctors by allowing much greater interactivity between uh, students and their instructor when they learn the material. Um, it, uh, that hands-on experimentation, that needing to deal with the material in an active way, think about it and learn how to apply the theoretical concepts rather than just the theoretical material itself, I think provides a much better basis for a practicing physician than learning all of the academic material in a somewhat dry and, and often uninspiring way of, of, a, of an academic classroom. At the same time, I think it's important to realize that medical care, in, in much the same way as many other parts of the life we lead, um, is evolving very, very quickly these days. What we learned in college 20 years ago is no longer enough to keep us as the qualified professionals that we would like to be. As it happens, currently about 80% of our students are in fact uh, people that already have degrees and they're, they're learning because they realize that they need to keep themselves reskilled and refreshed as the world around them changes. So I think there is a tremendous opportunity here for providing um, practicing doctors with um, high quality continuing medical education um, content that is uh, that is current, up to date, uh, untainted by various special interest groups, and um, really allows them to maintain their credentials sharp and, and fresh. One of the things that characterizes this new version of online learning is that it's inherently social. This is no longer the lonely activity of sitting there in your own in, in your living room watching videos and doing assessments, but really there is an entire social community of people interacting around the material. I think this is particularly valuable in the context of medical care as we think about the connections that can be formed, for example, um, across different types of medical professions, doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, and so on. Um, I think there's an opportunity also to create networks that transcend geography be it um, having a doctor who is on their own somewhere in some small hospital who needs to connect with somebody else in their area of specialty but there isn't anybody close by or even transcend geographical boundaries altogether uh, there is a tremendous amount that I think we can help teach people who uh, practice medicine in developing countries but at the same time there's also a lot that we can learn from them about things that they know about that we might not have encountered quite as directly so building a social structure around this material I think helps us all learn better and understand medicine in a much uh, much more encompassing way. One of the really amazing aspects of this type of online platform is that everything is instrumented so one can measure everything when a person is watching the video where they stop watching maybe because it was uh, less interesting and engaging which quiz questions they got wrong and then maybe resubmitted and got right everything is measured and that allows us to construct amazing analytics about what people are getting and what they aren't and at the same time perhaps discover correlations that um, if certain uh, students are having difficulty with a particular concept, maybe it's because they didn't do this assessment or they didn't watch this video to completion. So it allows us to both identify very quickly and very effectively, not just at the midterm or the final, but really as the class is ongoing on an immediate basis, which students are struggling with what concept, bring them in maybe for a discussion group that helps address the difficulties that they're having. And also as we keep track of a class and we see what's working what's not, we can provide that feedback back to the instructor and explain to them what's working in their way of teaching and what's not so that they can continuously improve their class in ways that we've not been able to do until now. 
I think a lot of people feel threatened by this, uh, by this new technology because they feel like it's going to take their jobs away, that people are going to get their education in an online platform and not need to come to college. I actually don't think that's the uh, likely outcome of this. I think what we're going to see more and more of is a hybrid model where students get a lot of their content in um, this online framework that's more engaging and then they come to class to be really inspired and taught in a way that goes back to teaching arguably the way it should have been. There's a dialogue, there's questioning, there's the development of critical thinking and problem solving skills. There's the opportunity to really um, connect with an instructor and learn to view him or her as a role model. Um, I mean, I think if we go back to our own educational past, very few of us can date the critical decisions that, um, that we made in our education to a, a lecture that we found particularly interesting. It's mostly by connecting with an individual and, and being inspired by them that caused us to make the choices that we did. I don't think that's a replaceable thing um, using technology. Rather, I think what we should consider as institutions is the fact that whether we as an institution engage with this technology assisted learning or not, somebody else will and the content will be there in high quality and effectively free and ubiquitous. Which means that we have to take this challenge up and figure out what value it is that we as an institution are providing to our students that goes beyond pure content dissemination. And I think that that value exists in those institutions that embrace this challenge and move up the value chain to this much more interactive learning will actually thrive in this new environment. I think there's a tremendous opportunity for all of us here to make um, educate, medical education on all of its levels, to, you know, starting from the pre-medical courses that are essential for getting into medical school, um, the courses that um, students take while in medical school, and the continuing medical education. I think there's a lot of people even in the developed world, even here in the United States, that find um, the kind of education that you need in order to get into medical school unattainable because of the cost issues and this provides a way for them to become better at, at, these, uh, at, at this discipline and, and make their way into medical school. A lot of critics have honed in on the lack of retention or the low completion rates in these courses as being a major criticism. Uh, and I think that if, certainly if you look at the numbers and you say the average completion rate in a MOOC is say 5 to 8 percent and people say well if we had that completion rate in our college classes that would be terrible and we would close down that university. Um, I think it's important to realize that only a very small fraction of the students entering these courses actually ever intend to complete it in the standard sense of the word. Um, many of these students are treating this like a library book. You browse the library, you find something that looks interesting, you take out that book, you bring it home, you read three, four chapters, when the loan period expires, you bring it back. You didn't read the book cover to cover and do all the author questions at the end, but that does, does that mean that the, that the book has failed you? No. Um, only a very small fraction of our students, I would say about 10%, um, actually intend to take this class to completion. And among those students who declare that intent, that they're committed to complete the class, the completion rate is about 70 to 80%. Um, certainly the people who participate in, in what we call the, the signature track, which is this identity verified track that is aiming at getting a, a meaningful credential, that completion rate is about 75%. So it's important to realize that these courses are many things to many people. And some people are treating this as just a resource to learn something new and they never intend to get a credential and that's just fine with me because I think one of the great things that these courses enable is risk-free exploration. You can take something, you can learn something new without being penalized for not having completed it and then you didn't have to pay for it, there's no failure on your transcript, it's just a way to learn something new. Whereas at the same time, for those people who are committed learners, it also gives the opportunity to get a meaningful credential at the end. I think this is a powerful technology that can be used in many different ways to help provide education to many people. Uh, one opportunity, it's a very interesting one, uh, is to help educate not just doctors but also patients about the critical things that um, are necessary for them in order to maintain their long-term health, for example, if they have a chronic disease. Um, I think that this combination of content on the one hand, assessments that force the students to interact and engage with the material so that we can be sure they're actually paying attention to what's uh, being explained so that 
has a potential improving their outcomes. And then at the same time, I think the community aspects of this form of learning that allow, in this case, patients to interact with other patients and learn from each other and, and create social support structures around the material, I think is a tremendously powerful notion here. We've had a little bit of that in some of our courses, almost incidentally. We've had a course on the mental health and illness, and a good number of the students taking that were students that had mental illnesses, and I think they found tremendous value in having that um, support structure and being taught how to, um, at the same time, being taught how to uh, interpret their um, medical symptoms in a rigorous and, and sound way, at, and also to create these support structures around um, the material uh, with, by creating community. The, the MOOC really is a platform that provides basic capabilities for education. It conveys material, it incorporates a certain set of assessments, um, but there's so many other capabilities that one would like to have and offer as part of one's educational offering. Uh, and that can include things like uh, simulators that take students through perhaps a complex decision-making process in medicine. Um, it can, one can incorporate social tools like group formation for study groups or uh, collaborative note-taking and, and interaction perhaps around the patient's medical chart. There's a tremendous range of different tools that one can incorporate into the learning experience that will enhance it for the students. We realize that we, at, as an organization, cannot possibly build all of the really cool and amazing things that one could potentially benefit from in an educational setting, which is why we've just, we just recently announced a set of open APIs that we're planning to construct. APIs are application programming interfaces, and it's a way for people who construct some of these really cool and amazing tools to plug them into our platform so that they can then be used within the context of courses that could benefit from that. And this would allow people who write simulators, new forms of assessment, new forms of collaboration, um, new forms of uh, peer grading mechanisms, all of that can then be plugged in and used in different classes as they find them useful. One of the things that I think those of us that are engaged in this effort find the most inspiring is the personal stories that we get from students about the way that this has impacted their lives, and we get hundreds of those. Uh, one of these stories is about Raul, who uh, lives in Peru, wanted to study computer science, but there isn't a lot of computer science in his country, so he took our computer science courses online, used that as the basis for writing his Fulbright application, and then ended up being admitted into the Fulbright Scholarship Program and is now coming to study in the United States. Um, last week I heard about a student from Pakistan who was a star student in the Penn, uh, University of Pennsylvania Modern and Contemporary Mar American Poetry class, and on the strength of his performance in this class, at least partially, he got admitted to the University of Pennsylvania and is now coming to study there as, uh, for his undergraduate degree. Um, this is one type of access that this enables. This transcends, this helps transcend geographical boundaries. But there's other kinds of limits that uh, this technology can help people circumvent. So we get a lot of um, emails from people who have uh, health disabilities that prevent them from having access to standard education. Uh, we have uh, an email from an autistic student who effectively can't speak and communicates only by typing. But he and many other autistic students that we've heard from have uh, found that this form of, of learning is much more uh, amenable for them in terms of being able to do the work and, and succeed. Uh, we get emails from uh, from other types of from people with other types of health issues. There's a woman with stage four breast cancer who can't really leave her home except to go to the hospital and, and get her chemotherapy. And she wrote us to tell us that this is her only window into the outside world and what is otherwise a fairly difficult life. So I think that one of the really remarkable things about this is how it opens access to this precious thing of education that many of us take for granted to people who really just otherwise would not have that access.